Well, hello, Saddleback. It is good to see you today. Glad you are here. We are right now getting towards the end of summer. Uh, some of you guys, kids back in school. Some of you the next few weeks are going to get back in school. Many of you have finished your vacation for the summer. Some of you have like that one last vacation to get in. So it's the perfect time to ask you this question. Do you ever feel like you need a vacation from your vacation? You know what I'm talking about? Like, wow, the summer's over. I did not get the rest that I needed this summer. And we're going back into it right away. So I thought it would be the great weekend to talk about the rest that you need. A different kind of rest that all of us need. A rest even from the vacation that didn't give us all that we need. Because vacations, let's admit it, they are not all that we hope for. The, the worst family arguments that you've ever had, probably on vacation, right? The, the thing that you're going to laugh at, but only 20 years later, it happened on vacation. And the worst place you've ever stayed in your life was probably on vacation. You thought it was going to be great, but it didn't work out so well. Sure true for our family. I remember one time going up the West Coast, Shondell found a bed and breakfast for us to stay in. Shondell and I and our three younger kids at the time. And so we got in late, and they, and they got us in, hustled us up to the room. It was, it was okay. We slept okay. Got up in the morning, heading down towards the breakfast. It's a bed and breakfast. And we noticed something strange. There were like handrails bolted to all the walls as we were, as we were walking. We thought, That's strange. Walked around the corner, and we discovered that it was a bed and breakfast slash rest home. Our family stayed in a rest home overnight <laughs> for our vacation. Now, the sad thing about that is some of you, many of you have far worse stories than that, a place that you stayed. So vacations don't always meet all the needs that we have. Even the best vacation doesn't really give us the rest that we need on the inside. So we're going to take some minutes today to talk about the rest that we need from our restlessness, what happens on the inside that causes us to feel like I'm just not where I want to be. It's the feeling that I don't have enough. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough hope. And so we're restless inside. Or the feeling that we don't know how to stop. I just don't know how to stop this merry-go-round that I'm on. So we need rest inside. Or we don't know what to do next. Or we feel afraid of what we're facing next. Or we want something. We want something. We just can't seem to get it. Or that feeling that I'm just so unsure of the future. All of that causes us to need rest on the inside. So I'd like to take a vacation together for the next few minutes. A vacation for the inside, a vacation for your soul. A vacation that helps us to find the kind of rest that only God can give. And to do this, I want to bring out the big guns. I want to bring out the five-star resort of Bible chapters when it comes to giving us rest on the inside. It is Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a chapter that many of you know. But you know it not because it is a sentimental chapter. You know it because it is a powerful chapter. It has something to say to us that powerfully causes us to see how God can change our lives. And I want you to know from the beginning that Psalm 23 is for everyone. Sometimes I think people look at Bible chapters and they think, oh, that's for Christians. No, this, this is for everyone. God wrote this chapter for you. So whatever your background, whether you're here the first time or the thousandth time, whatever your religious background, God wrote this chapter for you to give every one of us the kind of rest that we need. And what I want to do today, I know you may know some of the words in this chapter already. What I want to do is not say some words that you already know. What I want to do is really walk through this and do this chapter together. Just walk through the ways that this chapter shows us how to get rest on the inside, how to get the rest that we need, how to get a vacation for our soul. Walk through it and do it together. Six ways that you and I can get rest for our soul. So let's look at them. Number one, first thing that you do is this. You depend on your shepherd. You depend on your shepherd. To get rest for your soul, you have to look at what your soul is resting on. You have to look at what you're depending on in life. And if you're depending on the right thing, your soul is at rest. On the wrong thing, it's not at rest. The Bible says this in Psalm 23, 1. Let's read this one together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. That's the rest part. I won't be in want. To not be in want means you won't be overwhelmed and driven by what you don't have. We were talking about vacations. One of the things about vacations is we feel like we don't have as good a vacation as everyone else. Because we are comparing our vacation to their Instagram vacation. You know what I'm talking about? They took one picture of the one good moment in their two-week vacation, and they Instagrammed it out for everybody, and you think, they had a great vacation. No, they didn't. 
No, they didn't. The picture doesn't always tell the whole truth. In fact, let me, let me show you a picture. Uh, we, Shondell and I went up to Reading for a couple of days to see my dad, and I got to go fishing for a couple of days. So let me show you a picture of me fishing on vacation. That's a restful spot. What that picture does not say is Tom caught no fish this day. <laughs> that's the truth. What the picture does not say is the only thing he caught was his earlobe with the hook. That's, that's what it doesn't say. So when you talk about the rest that you need, sometimes when we compare with other people, we find ourselves in this situation, this circumstance where we're, we're, we're in want. I want that. If I could just get that, I would be happy. If I could just get that, I'd be at peace. Now, we know somehow it's not true because we've gotten it before and it didn't give us what we needed. But sometimes we live in want. How do you break through? How do you get the rest? How do you get to a different place? Well, you do what this psalm says. You depend on God as your shepherd. Now, you know what I think is the most difficult part of trusting Jesus Christ as your shepherd? It's recognizing that you're a sheep, admitting that you're a sheep. I, I have to depend on someone. I need to depend on someone. We all want to be independent. And where we often get messed up is we want Jesus to be the shepherd, but we all want to be the sheepdog. We want to be barking and telling all the other sheep where to go, right? But that's not what God made us to be. The Bible says we are a sheep. Now, to be fair, the Bible also compares us to deer and to eagles and to lions sometimes, but more often than not, it compares us to a sheep. And it's not because God wants us to be docile. He doesn't. It's because he wants us to be dependent. And a sheep has to depend on a shepherd. So we want to be in control of our universe. We want to be independent and self-reliant. But the Bible says we are a sheep. We have to depend on our shepherd, and that shepherd is Jesus Christ. We want to control our destiny. We want to determine our fate. But we, the Bible says, are a sheep needing to depend on a shepherd. We want to think we can carry the world on our shoulders. But we... Well, just to get this in, let me show you a picture this time of what we are. We are a sheep. That's what we are. <laughs> Every one of us has to come to this moment in life where we determine, am I going to depend on myself or am I going to depend on, that, on God in this circumstance? And we come to that moment again and again and again and again. And God's sense of humor is he knew that when he made sheep, and he made us. He knew from the beginning he was going to compare us to sheep and help us to re realize, to understand that we have to depend on a shepherd because sheep have to have a shepherd. Without a shepherd, they're going to die. Without a shepherd, they're in incredible danger. There's no such thing as an independent sheep who can be safe. You might have heard of something called a cast sheep. When, when a, a sheep gets a little bit fat, a lot of wool, it can actually get so heavy, so top-heavy, that it flips over and it can't right itself. It, it can kick its little legs as fast as it wants to, but it can't right itself. And eventually it'll die, it'll suffocate if nobody comes, a shepherd doesn't come and right this cast sheep. There's, there's spiritual lessons here for all of us. Because when we get fat and we get fleecy, sometimes we get in a comfortable spot and we're, whoop, we're flipped over and we're thinking, how do I get right again? So I went this week and I found on YouTube a video of a shepherd, how it writes a cast sheep. You maybe didn't expect to see a video of a shepherd writing a cast sheep in church today, but there's some deep spiritual lessons in this, no, no doubt about it. So watch the, this intricate process of how this happens up on the screen for a couple of minutes. That's it. <laughs> That's it. The most important thing about that video is 13-second video. One second for the shepherd to write the sheep. Sometimes we're flat, upside down, wondering how do I get myself right again? And what we need to do, it only takes one second, is depend on the shepherd. Depend on the shepherd. But you and I as human beings, we've all done this. What we do is this. We're upside down. Things aren't right. We feel Jesus is coming by, and Jesus says, hey, can I, can I get you upright again? And what do we do? We say, no, I want to try just a little bit longer to do it by myself. So we keep kicking. We keep kicking. Some of you have been kicking for a long time. And Jesus Christ is right there saying, I am willing to set you right again. Set your soul right again. I'm willing to do it right now. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. You know what that means? That means that if I'm in want, if I'm in want, at least at that moment, the Lord is not my shepherd. If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. If I'm in want, the Lord is not my shepherd in that moment. Something else is. My money might be my shepherd. Other people's opinions might be my shepherd. My need to have independence in my life might be my shepherd. I don't know what it is, but it is something else. This, the promise of this is when Jesus Christ is the one I depend on, I don't have to live in want anymore. He gives rest for my soul. Without that relationship of depending on him, something is desperately missing in every one of our lives. You may have a lot, you may have a little, you may be successful, you may be unsuccessful in life. I'm not talking about those surface things. I'm talking about the depth of your soul, depth of who you are. Without the love and direction that comes from our shepherd, from who he is, we are missing the most important part of us. Now I said I want to do this together, not just talk about it. So right now I want to invite you to say just a very brief prayer. Now, you can pray with your eyes open or closed. Jesus, most of the time, prayed with his eyes open because we know that's what they did in his day. So either way you want to pray is fine with me. But just this brief prayer saying, I depend on you as my shepherd. Would you say to God right now, God, I'm going to stop facing this alone. I admit it. I need you. I depend on you. I depend on you for that decision, for that job, for that relationship. I depend on you with my anxiety, with my doubt, with my fear, with my insecurity. I depend on you for that opportunity, for that dream. In Jesus' name, I depend on you as my shepherd. Amen. You put confidence in your shepherd. That's one of the ways that you get rest for your soul. Now, the second way is you trust God to refresh your soul. Trust God to refresh your soul. Our souls need to be fresh because our souls get thirsty. We live in a world where our souls get thirsty. There's a lot of trouble in this world. There's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot to weary your soul in this world. And so your soul gets thirsty. It needs to be refreshed. God's willing to refresh it. Psalm 23, 2 and 3. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Now, if you are soul weary... That sounds so good. Green pastures, quiet waters. Truth of the matter is, most of us don't know how to handle green pastures and quiet waters. We get to a green pasture, a place of abundance, and our, our productivity kicks in. We think, I gotta get this thing mowed. The grass is a little bit too long. I gotta get this thing a little bit greener. Or sometimes our guilt kicks in for some of us. We don't think we deserve green pastures. Some of you don't think you deserve places of abundance in your life, what God wants to do in your life. Or sometimes our comparison kicks in. We look at our green pasture and we think, I think his green pasture is a little bit greener than my green pasture. And we don't appreciate the place of abundance that God has given. He makes me lie down in green pastures. If you're going to lie down, if you're going to take some time to rest in that green pasture, you're going to have to learn to stop and to enjoy the places of abundance that God has given in your life. Not feel guilty, accept it and enjoy it. Not compare to others, accept it and enjoy it. Is it okay just to enjoy the love that God has given, the grace that God has given, the things that God has given? Or do you find yourself having to rush off to the next project, the next appointment, the next prayer, always having to do that? If you're going to get the rest that you need, there have to be places in my life and in your life where we stop. In fact, it says here, he makes me lie down. God will help us to stop and enjoy the green pastures. What I'm saying is this. Stop running through green pastures. Stop. Stop and enjoy who he is. Stop running from green pastures. Stop in the green pasture and enjoy the abundance that he has given. That's one of the ways that you and I find rest for our soul. Augustine famously said, O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our souls are restless, searching, until they find their rest in thee. God wants to give rest for your soul. Green pastures, quiet waters. Quiet waters, what, what's the picture there? Well, it's a sheep trying to get a drink, and quiet waters, the still waters, were easier to drink from. They didn't like to drink from the rushing waters. I, 
I think it made them burp or something. So they didn't like to do that. They liked the quiet waters. At the quiet waters, they could drink in deeply. And there need to be times in my life, in your life, where we drink in deeply the most important things about us. More often than most of us do, we need to stop long enough to drink those things in. Now, I can tell you the most important thing about you in three words. It's not my words, it's God's words. The most important thing about you is this, God loves you. That's why you were created, because God loves you. That's why you're given the life that you're given, because God loves you. That's why he promises us a heaven in Jesus Christ, because God loves you. Nothing more important about you. Now, I know many of you know that. When was the last time you stopped long enough to just drink that in? That's why we're here, to drink in these important truths about who we are. It's one of the ways that we get rest for our soul. A third thing in this Psalm 23 vacation for our soul, third thing you and I do is you follow God's path. Follow God's path. There there are a lot of paths that you can follow in life. You can follow the path of least resistance. You can follow the path of greatest gain. But every path isn't the right path. And God says, I've got a right path for you that when you follow it, you're going to feel rest for your soul. Psalm 23, 3. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What is righteousness? That's the one thing in that verse, that, and it's the key to the verse. Righteousness. What is that? It sounds complicated. It isn't. It's just right. It's just what's right for you. Righteousness. What's right for you? To have a relationship with God, that's right for you. To be involved in the things God wants for your life, that's right for you. That's what righteousness is all about, being made right with God and living the right life that he's made you to live. That's what God wants for you. In fact, it says here, he will guide you into that path. It tires us out to be on the wrong path. You get down the wrong path and you think, oh, I gotta gotta get all the way back to where I was. And you know what I think is even more tiring? Being, Being at a crossroads and not being sure what path to take. You feel worn out just by doing nothing, and some of you are right there right now. God says, I want to guide you into this path of righteousness. So where do you find the signpost? How how do you find out how to get on this path of righteousness? Well, God tells us, I'll show you. I've, in fact, given you my word, given you the Bible to show you the direction to go. 2 Timothy 3.16, the next verse in your outline says, the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God. And it's useful to teach us what's true, to make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and it helps us to do what is right, the path of righteousness. So how do these signposts work? That's the big question most of us have. I want to know where to live. I want to know who I'm supposed to marry, what job I'm supposed to have, what school I'm supposed to be a part of. I want to know how to make these daily decisions of life. Where are the signposts in the Bible for that? You want to know where to live. You're going to leaf through the Bible hoping to find the name of some city that you're supposed to live in, praying the whole time that the word Barstow is not in the Bible anywhere. (laughs) Sorry, if you're from Barstow, I'm, I'm sorry. But it's 110 out there. I mean, you got to admit. So you're just praying. No, that's not how it works. So how does it work? How do you figure those things out? Here's the secret. A lot of people never discovered this simple secret. 90% of what we're supposed to do in daily life, it's in the Bible already. If you'll do the 90%, God will show you the 10% as you're doing the 90%. The Bible tells us, love your neighbor. You do that. The Bible tells us, love God, you do that. The Bible tells us, talk to me. God says, talk to me, you do that. The Bible says, gather together with other, other believers, other people who are wanting to find faith in their life. You do that. As you do those things, guess what? The other things become clear. A lot of people want to reverse it. They say, God, if you'll show me where to live, then I'll show up in church, and I'll give, and I'll pray, and I'll do all these things. It doesn't work that way. You do the 90%, and the 10% will become more and more clear. Not as fast as you want, usually. God doesn't give us the answer as fast as we want because it's not when we needed it. But he will give you the answer where he wants you to be. So right now, we're walking through this and doing this together. Right now, in your mind, just think, what's the one thing that I know God wants me to do that I haven't done yet? There's something I know God wants me to do I haven't done it yet. Maybe it's being church. And that's why you're here today. And you make a commitment. I'm going to show up every week. 
Maybe it's talk to God more. Maybe it's spend more time in God's word. Five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. Maybe it has to do with the way you're treating people in your life or someone you need to connect with. As I talk about this, what's the one thing? I hope it's a sort of a small thing that you're thinking of, actually, because that's your first step. It doesn't have to be a big thing. How do you get on the path of righteousness? How does God guide us? One step at a time. You can't do it all at once, so what's the next step you need to take? That's how you get on God's path. You have to get on God's path by doing what he's asked you to do. Now, I gotta be honest with you about something. When you do what God asks, I think most of us want to immediately feel better in our soul, and it doesn't always work that way. You do not always immediately feel better when you do the right thing. Have you noticed that? If that was true, we'd always all do the right thing because we all want to feel better. No, it takes time for your emotions to catch up with your soul. You do the right thing, and it takes time. This is one of the lessons of maturity in life. We've taught this to our kids, all of us. It takes time for your emotions to catch up to your actions. So you do the right thing, and eventually God's going to let the emotions catch up with it. We get in trouble when we want to immediately feel right sometimes. Almost every time we want to immediately get a jolt, we do the wrong thing. We get involved in the wrong relationship, wrong, wrong habit, wrong decision, because we just want to feel better. No, you do better, you do right, and then eventually you're going to feel right. That's how it works. So what do you do to get rest for your soul? You depend on God as your shepherd. You trust God to restore your soul. You follow God's path. And then number four, you remember this. You remember God is with you. God is with you. God is with you in every circumstance of life. God is with you in the good circumstances of life. But this psalm wants us to understand that God is with you in the most difficult circumstances of life. So these familiar verses from Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things in that verse. First, it says, even though I walk through the valley. It doesn't say even if I walk. He assumes that we're going to walk through valleys, and we all know that we do in this life. You're going to go through valleys. You can't escape them. They're an inevitable part of the road of this life. We won't have any valleys of the shadow of death in heaven, but we have them here on earth. And unless I learn to deal with the truth that there's going to be valleys, I'm always going to be terrified of the valley that I'm in or the next one I'm going into. When you realize they're going to be there, then you can realize the next truth. No matter how deep the valley, he will be with you. I know that fear of facing a valley in your life is what's keeping many of us from finding the rest that we need. There is no valley that you can face in life where he will not be with you. God doesn't lie to us and say there's not going to be any valleys. He tells us the truth. And he says, I'll be with you through every valley. You'll never be alone. In fact, not only does he say he'll be with us, but notice what he says. I will comfort you even in the valley, even in the difficulty. I'll be there close enough to you to comfort you. And he even tells us how. With your rod and your staff, you comfort me. So we're still talking about sheep here, still using that picture. The rod and the staff was something that a shepherd used. The rod was used to beat off an enemy. The staff was a long stick that was used to guide the sheep. The rod was used for protection of the sheep. The staff was used for correction of the sheep. Write this in with me. God comforts you through both protection and correction. Through both. Sometimes I go through tough times because of what somebody else, something else did to me. And in that case, God will comfort me through his protection. And sometimes I go through tough times more often than I don't want to admit because of what I did to myself, my own selfishness. And God will comfort me even then through his correction in my life. Even if you've messed it up, God's there to comfort you. So he gives you his protection. He knows the enemies that you're facing. And he will protect you, even in this world where we face evil, by giving you his comfort. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. How do you do that? Through the comfort of the fact that God will be with you. But I think it's important to realize that even if my own selfishness has messed things up in life, God's still there 
to comfort me in that. I think a lot of us think, if somebody else messed it up, God will comfort me. If I messed it up, I'm on my own. That is not true. You're never on your own. He will be with you through every valley. That's his commitment. So look at the promise of Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you, God says. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. That is the picture that God wants us to have through every difficulty of life. So right now, just for 10 seconds, whatever difficulty you're facing or you're afraid of facing in the future, right now, picture the fact that God is there. Don't just picture the worry. Picture the fact that God is there with the worry, with the anxiety, with the reality of that valley that you're facing. God promises, I will be with you. You won't have to face this alone. The fifth thing to do as you and I get rest for our soul is to appreciate. To appreciate what God has given in our lives. You know that old question, do you see the cup as half empty or half full? That just depends on our personalities. We all have different kinds of personalities. It's the way that we look at it. But in Psalm 23, the cup isn't half empty or half full. It's overflowing because it's not from our perspective. Psalm 23 is from God's perspective. The overflowing blessings that he's given into every one of our lives. Psalm 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You appreciate what God has given. Every one of us can look at our lives and easily see things that we don't have. And it's very easy for me, I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to let what isn't spoil what is. I think we all struggle with this. To let what I don't have spoil what I do have. I've got this blessing in my life, but then I see that somebody else has a a blessing that may seem like a greater blessing and seems like the blessing that I have, I deserve as good a blessing as they have because I know what a rotten person they are. And so I think, why don't I have that blessing? And it spoils the blessing that God has given. I've learned something from my friends in places like Rwanda and Nigeria who find the blessing in the one thing that they do have. You go into a small house, dirt floor, and there's one wooden shelf, and on that wooden shelf is the one cup that they have in their house. that They used to drink milk, or they used to drink tea. Maybe it was passed down through the family, or maybe it was given by somebody that came through, but proudly displayed is that one cup they're grateful for. You and I, our shelves are overflowing with cups, but our cups are not overflowing. We're not seeing what God has given, how much God has given. I struggle with it. You struggle with it. It's one of the struggles of having a lot of stuff in our lives. So i got to take time to appreciate what God has given. What do you have? When I see their appreciation, it encourages my appreciation. Now, we appreciate what God has given in the things, the material things. The Bible tells us that he's given us all good things to enjoy. But there's an even deeper appreciation. And that is appreciating what God has done in our hearts, in our souls. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you're not, you can become a believer right now. Just right now in your mind say, I believe in you, Jesus. I ask you for forgiveness. I ask you for life. I want to follow you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, here's the one verse among hundreds of what he's given to your soul. 1 Timothy 1.14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. He has given you, he's poured out on you an abundance of faith and grace and love. It's promised to everyone who believes in Christ, so it's promised to you. You can trust right now that he's poured that out into your life. So as we do this psalm together right now, thank God. Thank God right now for one thing in your life. Just one thing. The first thing that pops into your mind might be a little thing, a big thing. Thank God for one person in your life. They might be sitting next to you. Thank God for one person in your life. And then thank God for one thing he's done for your soul. Might be his grace, might be his faith that he's given you, the love that he's given you, or something else that comes into your mind. When I do that, when you do that, it gives rest to my soul. All right, 
One final stop in this vacation. The sixth thing that you and I do, Psalm 23 talks about, to get rest for our soul. The rest that we need is you focus on all and forever. You focus on all and forever. So often in life, we focus on the here and the now. But to get rest for our soul, the rest that we need, we have to focus on the all and the forever. Look at Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All the days of my life, goodness and love, house of the Lord forever. One of the most important life skills is learning how to practice in the here and now while you focus on the all and forever. You have to practice in the here and now. Like you got to like have a job, you got to eat, those kinds of things. We do live in the here and now, no doubt about that. But the way to find rest for your soul is to focus on the all and forever. What God is doing and how God is doing it in our lives. You can't ignore the here and now, but you can't get your identity from the here and now. That comes from the all and forever. Who you are comes from the all and forever. All the days of my life. God's goodness and God's love given into your life all the days of my life. Not some of the days of my life. All of the days of my life. The days I feel it, the days I don't feel it. The days I call on it, the days I don't call on it. God's love, God's goodness are there. And forever I dwell in the house of the Lord. Your ultimate future is guaranteed in Jesus Christ. That's what you hold on to. Now you think, I don't want to think much about heaven. You know, heaven's a long ways away. I got a lot to do here and now. I'll wait till I get to heaven to enjoy heaven. And what I want to invite you to do is start enjoying heaven today. You don't have to wait till you get there. Enjoy the fact that no matter what you're going through, no matter what somebody said about you, what happened to you this last week, you're looking forward to an eternity with him. And that's, that's your life. That's the eternity that you and I can hang on to. You focus on all and forever. Now, as we've walked through these six things, I'm hopeful, prayerful, that it's provided some rest to our souls. But the question is, how do you, like, hang on to this as, 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 you, as you go out? Because I think for a lot of us, it's like you go to a fast food place, you get something to drink in a to-go cup, and you're going out, and you want to make sure you don't spill it. So as you're going out, you've got to make sure you put a lid on it so you don't spill it on the way out. I think some of us feel that way about church. We come in, okay, and I'm going out, and it's like, okay, I got it right. I got rest for my soul. Nobody touch me. I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody mess me up. Nobody mess with me in the parking lot especially, all right? Today, just today, please. Because i got to hold on to this. How do you get, like, the cover on this, the lid on this, so it doesn't spill over? Well, there's several things that we can do in order to have this happen in our lives. Jesus gave us some ways to do this. In fact, we're going to end with one of them. Jesus gave us a way to cement in our hearts what he did on the cross to give us all these blessings we've talked about, all this rest for our soul that we've talked about. So we're going to share in the Lord's Supper in the next few minutes to remind ourselves to hold on to these truths. Let me invite you to also do this. A couple other things. First, take these notes and maybe have them somewhere where you can go through these simple exercises one more time this week somewhere so that I do it here, but I also take it into my life, take it into my everyday world. In fact, if you want, you can take the flap and fill out your name real quick on it or email address. And we'll, I'll be glad to send you these notes with all these steps in it this next week. We do this every week. It's called our message action plan. So you can just write message action plan and we'll send you this week's and uh, it'll help you to walk through what we just talked about. And then finally, what I'd like to do is pray through what we just talked about. I want to put a prayer up on the screen that prays what we just have walked through together as a commitment to Christ. If this is your commitment, if this is the faith that you have, I want to invite you right now, all of us together, to pray this prayer out loud together. Would you pray it with me? This prayer that's up on the screen. Lord, you are my shepherd. I depend on you. You give green pastures and quiet waters. I ask you to restore my soul. Although I will walk through the valley of suffering, I remember that you will be with me. You prepare the table and you fill the cup. And I thank you for what you have given. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell 
in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus heard that prayer. And he will bless that prayer in your life during this week. Hi, I'm Jay Cranda, the online pastor here at Saddleback Church. We're so glad you joined us to watch this message today. At Saddleback, we believe that life is better together. That's why we want you to get connected to our church family, whether in person or online. We have campuses all over Southern California and on four continents all around the world that would love to welcome you to their weekend services. You can find a campus near you at saddleback.com slash locations. And if you're not able to attend a campus in person, don't worry. We have an online community designed just for you. You'll have an opportunity to connect with the messages each week and find resources to help you grow your faith. Thanks again for watching, and we look forward to welcoming you into our church family.